The readings this week from the Acts of the Apostles describe various incidents in Paul's second missionary journey. Yesterday's text spoke of his experience in Athens. In today's reading, we find him in another Greek city, Corinth. Here is elsewhere, Paul begins his preaching in the local synagogue. He appeals there both to Jews and to those Gentiles, here referred to as worshipers of God, who have been drawn to the synagogue by the moral and religious teaching of the Bible. Although some respond positively to Paul's preaching, others do not. And so he leaves the synagogue and turns to the other groups that make up the majority of the city's population. Although the account in Acts of the beginning of the church in Corinth is extremely brief, we do know a good deal about its makeup and early development from letters which Paul later wrote to it. This year, once again, I taught an introduction to the Bible at the undergraduate level at the University of St. Michael's College. In the second term, we studied the Gospel of Luke and the first of Paul's letters to the Corinthians. First Corinthians is in many ways a remarkable document because Paul writes it in order to deal with problems and difficulties that have arisen in Corinth and that have been reported to him and to answer questions asked of him by the Corinthians themselves. The letter offers a window onto the practices and beliefs, the tensions and conflicts of the Corinthian church. The letter is also extremely revealing in regard to Paul and to his sense of continuing responsibility for the churches that he founded. From the outset of the letter, it's clear that things are not going well in Corinth. It's been reported to Paul that there are quarrels and divisions among believers. Some are identifying with Paul, others with Apollos, another preacher, and others again with Cephas. These divisions are rooted at least in part in arrogance. Although baptized in Christ, some continue to cherish things valued by their culture wisdom and knowledge, eloquence and sophistication. Such people are tending not only to look down on fellow believers less sophisticated than themselves, but also to question Paul's authority and teaching. As they look back at what he did when he was among them, they find him lacking in terms both of the content of his teaching and the style in which he delivered it. Paul's first response to people like that is to remind them that Christianity is not about worldly wisdom, but about the cross of Christ. Though the cross seems to non-believers to be weakness and foolishness, it embodies, in fact, the power and the wisdom of God. God's foolishness, Paul says, is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Paul has also heard of examples of gross immorality in the community about which people have done nothing. This, he says, is a sign not of spiritual maturity, but of spiritual immaturity. Believers in Corinth are also divided about what kind of relationship they should have with pagan culture and practices that surround them. Some are claiming that because the pagan gods do not exist, they're free to participate in banquets and other social events that unfold in pagan temples. Others are scandalized at such practices and believe them incompatible with a serious Christian life. While Paul largely agrees theoretically with the first group, he sees in their attitudes an arrogance and insensitivity to the weaker members of the community that is undermining their common life. One of the main themes of the letter is the church. 
what he, Paul sees developing in Corinth is a kind of religious individualism in which people are more preoccupied with themselves and their own gifts than with the well-being of the community. To counteract such an attitude, Paul develops the idea of the church as the body of Christ. Through faith and baptism, we have become members of Christ and of one another. Just as all the parts of the body depend on and complement one another, so it is with the church. The different gifts and ministries that exist in it are all given by God for the common good. In the course of arguing this point, Paul writes what has come to be known as his hymn to love. Without love, he affirms wisdom and knowledge and all the other gifts are of no value. In describing love as patient and kind, as not boastful or arrogant, he directly opposes it to what is going on in Corinth. The divisions in the church have spread even to the Eucharist. At that time, the Eucharist was still celebrated in the context of a meal. People gathered for their weekly celebration in the home of one of the wealthier members of the community. His social equals tended to arrive early and to eat with him and his family, while workers and slaves came later and went hungry as they waited for their betters to eat and drink their fill. Paul repudiates such goings on. It is not the Lord's Supper that you are eating, he says. To underline his point, he cites the traditional account of the Last Supper. It declares that at its heart, the Eucharist is a memorial of the self-giving of Jesus unto death for us. To disregard the poor is to show contempt for the body of Christ. It is to make a mockery of the Eucharist. Paul's letter reveals the enormous challenges the first Christians faced in embracing the gospel. One does not learn how to put on Christ overnight. It takes time and effort and the gift of God's Spirit. The initial calling into existence of a community of faith is only the beginning. The community needs to grow and develop. For Paul, there is no better means for it to do so than what he calls the more excellent way of love. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs for all of us that are sharing in this Eucharist will deepen our sense of belonging to the body of Christ and of being members one of the other. Let us pray to the Lord. Amen. For Christians throughout the world that we might bear witness to the gospel by lives of love and service, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. For all those who for whatever reason are pushed to the margins of society, that those who can will reach out to them let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the ill and for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our deceased relatives and friends and for those who have died this night, that they will be brought to the fullness of life in God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Yes. 